Thank you, Sharbil, and thanks for coming. And Sharbil suggested we begin with the prayer, which is always a good idea. So let's just say Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have entrusted ourselves to our Blessed Mother in Heaven. And I'm just going to comment on something Charbel said at the end, which is my column in the Catholic Weekly, and the series Question Time 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, because 6 is about to come out too. I sent my 900th column to the Catholic Weekly last week. And every three years since the beginning, well, after three years of writing the column, which began in 2005, people were asking me, are you going to publish this as a book? Because I, I, cop, I photocopy these columns, I put them in a folder, I, I send them out to my friends, how useful it would be if you had a book. So that led to question time, just question time. And then three years later, Question time two, so then the first one became question time one with a different cover. And now we're up to question time six, which questions uh, 750 to 900. I'm going through the final edit of it. I've got all 900 or all, all 150 on my screen at the moment, and I'm editing them. You have to do a few edits as you go along. and. I've done 50 of the 150, so perhaps in another couple of weeks I will have finished that. Then it has to go through a few more stages, but perhaps in another month or two. Let's say not one that's, that's too little for this, but another two to three months, question time six might be out too. So let's come to the final exam. Well, let's start with Dying to Live, because both of these books have a very interesting origin, and it didn't come from me. These books would not exist either of them, except for a suggestion of somebody. I was giving a retreat in Kenthurst, and this is now only two years ago, when a man who said, Father, I'm 79, wouldn't it be good if there were a book about life after death for people who don't believe in it? And I thought, that's a tremendous idea. I don't know of any such book. I've written quite a book, quite a bit, in the Catholic Weekly on topics related to that, I could start from what I've got, I could write th that book, and that led to Dying to Live, which I wrote over the period of 2000, 2021. And then I finished it towards the end of the year, it came out early in 2022, it has sold exceptionally well. Of all the books that I've published, this one has sold by far the most. And it has helped a lot of people. We've got very, very positive feedback on that book. And I just want to tell you one story, and this is a woman to pray for, and someone who works here in Perusia is very aware of this whole episode. An engineer with a municipal council in Sydney bought extra copies, he said, for some of my staff, including two Muslim ladies. And then he bought the extra copies, and then I see him regularly, and he was beginning to fill me in on one of the Muslims, who was a woman from Indonesia, had attended a Catholic school for quite a bit of her schooling, and started to read Dying to Live, asking him many questions as she went along, but she really took an interest in the book. And then she started asking him, can I go to Mass with you? Because he goes to Mass on Friday, uh, every day of the week from his office. He can walk to the nearby parish church. She started going with him on Fridays. She finished dying to live, and then he asked me, what do I give her next? And I said, well, give her a journey into truth, which is a commentary on the catechism and explains the whole of our Catholic faith. She started reading that, and she was highlighting it and underlining it and asking him many, many questions. And then the last time I saw him, he said, she's finally finished that book. And it looks very promising that she might want to become a Catholic, to be baptized. So pray for her. Dena is her name. And it would be uh, just uh, a wonderful fruit of one book. 
and who knows how many other people will be affected and at least become, begin to believe in life after death and prepare well for it. So that book came out. A friend in Brisbane who bought extra copies for his friends there wrote to me, and it would be about May or June of last year, and he said, please write another book in this same style. The style, for those who have read the book, is very different from my other books, which is a more formal style. This is very informal, conversational, short sentences, sometimes a series of words which don't make up a sentence, but that's what you can do in this style, and, and short chapters as well, and easy to read. People are commenting on that. So he said, please write another book in this same style. And I thanked him for the email, and I, as I've said many times in commenting on that, I had no intention whatsoever to write another book. I don't have time to write books. I'm writing books somehow, but I, I, I don't have time. I'm very, very busy. So then about a month later, I was praying about this in our chapel where I live at, and I run a study center. And an idea came to me, which was, well, Lord, if there is a topic for which I have already written something, and it might be related to what I have just written, then it's worth a thought. And the thought then came to me immediately, which was, the final chapter of Dying to Live is titled, What Must I Do? The reader has come at least to the final chapter, and is asking that question, what must I do to get to heaven? I believe now in life after death. I believe in God. I believe in heaven. What must I do to get there? And there's a number of practical suggestions, including especially be sorry for your sins. And here are a few sins that you might have committed. And then I thought, well, that chapter needs to be developed into not only here are a few sins, but here are the Ten Commandments and a whole series of aspects of moral life to be preceded by, as part three of the Catechism will tell us, aspects of general moral theology, like the role of conscience, like the different ways in which we come to know what is right and wrong, like the role of the emotions, the role of suffering. And so that led very quickly to the idea I can write another book. And that would have been towards the end of June when I made that decision. And this is, mind you, with very little time. But if I have extra time, I can use that to write another book, starting with especially Journey into Truth, because that was a whole treatment of the whole catechism, and I would be using the material from part three. I would have to adapt it, reword it. I would have to add quite a bit more, but at least that was the start. So on the 1st of July of last year, 2022, I started writing. I had a little bit of time that day. And I said to myself, this is the first day of the last six months of 2022. This book has to be finished by December 31st. I used all the available time, which is, I say, not all that much, except that last year there were a number of health issues which gave me more time. I couldn't do certain things that I was doing before in the name of exercise or sport which I could then use to write the book. And that was very, very valuable. So God maybe visited me with a few health issues so that I could get this book finished a little bit earlier. At the end of October, which is now the fourth month of writing, I was giving a retreat to the Carmelite nuns in Launceston. And I said to myself, I had written practically the whole book by then. I will finish this book while giving that retreat. They had two meditations a day, plus quite a bit of confessions. So I knew with the time available, evenings as well, I could, I could finish the book, which I did. So the book was finished as regards its first draft and a little bit of editing in four months, not the six months that I had dedicated to doing it. So I was giving thanks to God that the book was now in that form. And so we titled it, this time the, the title came from me, 
the previous time I was in a get-together with some members of Opus Dei, and I was saying, look, I've got this book. It's almost finished. I need a title. I'm thinking of something to do with belief in life after death. And then someone came up with the idea, dying to live. So that's tremendous. So that was how dying to live became the title of that first book. When I checked online to see whether there were any other books with the same title, which is always a good idea to do, I found six books, I think maybe five plus mine is the sixth now, that begin Dying to Live. But each one has a different subtitle. This one is Reflections on Life After Death. And others are about different aspects of life and death. So I was on safe ground with the title and also with the, the content of the book. So when, then with this one on, on preparing for the judgment, I thought of the final exam. And as Charbel explained before, we take many exams in life, but there's one we are all going to take, and we cannot afford to fail this one. And that is the judgment at the moment of death. And I refer back very, very often in this book to the earlier book, maybe enticing the reader who hasn't bought the book and read it to buy it and read it. I was talking about the launch today with a number of men last night. And someone came up with a very novel way of looking at this book, The Final Exam. And it was, could you say that we're all going to take the exam, this is the textbook for the exam. I thought, it is. That's exactly what this is. This is the textbook for the final exam for the judgment. If anybody reads this book, now mind you, there are other books on moral life in Christ, starting with the Catechism and many books on moral theology and books on the faith that deal with the whole aspect of morality. But this is the textbook. If you read this book, you know all you need to know to pass that exam, to live a good life, in other words. And when you fail, to be sorry and tell God you're sorry. This book, like Dying to Live, is not addressed to Catholics. Throughout the book, except towards the end, I make very little reference to scripture. I make some because I've justified doing that in Dying to Live, where we had a chapter on the scriptures, who wrote the Bible, when was it written, how do we know that the texts we have are more or less what they wrote then, and were these people credible? So we've justified looking at the Bible, and we've justified looking at what the church has to say, the Catholic Church, that is. But I make very little reference to the church and the Bible in most of this book, The Final Exam, because it's based on reason and the natural law. One of the first chapters is the objective character of morality, because the reader, I, I put questions into the mind of an average reader who is not a Catholic, who might be a Buddhist, a Hindu, an atheist, anything and is asking the question, one day I can understand God is going to judge me, but what is his standard? I think I'm a pretty good person. I'm married, I'm still married to my wife. I brought up a couple of kids, they're pretty good kids. I think I'm a pretty good person. Is that enough? Or does God have some standard that I don't know about? If so, I hope this book will tell me what that is. So that, that one of the first chapters is the objective character of morality based on the natural law. That is to say, based on human nature, which all human beings of whatever religion have in common. We are all human. And human nature, by its very nature, gives us some forms of conduct that are compatible with it, suitable with it, for developing that human nature and certain forms of conduct that are going to hurt this human nature and our social nature as well to live together in a society. So there's a long chapter on the natural law. And that chapter I had already given, now that I think of it, as a seminar in the University of Tasmania Law School when I was chaplain of the university there in the early 90s, where I first went 
to Tasmania the year before we began to live there, which was 1992. In October of the previous year, I was having a get-together with a few students that we had to know from other sources in the law school. And when we finished the get-together, the students introduced me to the dean, who was a very fine man from Ghana in Africa. And he said, you must come, come and give us a talk on the natural law sometime. And I smiled. And I thought to myself, I have no intention nor the credibility to give anything on the natural law. I just don't know enough about it. I mean, I knew what it was in basics, but not to give something in a seminar in the law school. Sometime later, I was asked to give a, cla a class, a few series, a, a series of classes on the natural law to some members of Opus Dei. And I bought a book called 50 Questions and Answers on the Natural Law by Charles Rice from the University of Notre Dame in the US, and it was a brilliant book. And when I was giving those classes, I thought to myself, every law student in this country should be exposed to this material. And then when I was chaplain of the university, I went back to the law school where this dean had now come up to UTS in Sydney. And I went to the, the dean then, it's a woman who later became the governor of Tasmania, Kate Warner, and I asked her, do you teach the natural law in the faculty here, and she said, really, I don't know, but if anybody does, it would be Michael Stokes. The reason she didn't know was that there was no subject called the natural law, which I suspect you wouldn't get in most secular universities anyway. But she thought, if somebody teaches a segment of a bigger subject that would include the natural law, it would be Michael Stokes. Well, that was good because I was playing tennis every week with Michael Stokes. He was a Mormon, a really fine man. And, and, he's, and I asked him, do you teach the natural law? And he says, I don't. It's too vast a subject. But if you wanted to give one of my two-hour seminars for jurisprudence students, I'd be very happy. So I prepared it, put lots of footnotes, put it in academic language, and then I gave it over the, uh, those, those two hours. And I, I was aware that most of the students would be not be Catholic. In Tasmania, about half the percentage of the population is Catholic as in the rest of the country. It's about maybe 12, 15% are Catholic there. And most of the students will not be practicing their faith if they were Catholic. So anyway, I gave them this subject on the natural law and I said some very powerful things about abortion just to challenge them a little bit. Anyway, so I asked Michael the next time I played tennis with him, how did they take that? And, they, and he said, they really liked it, and so did I. Can you give it again next year? So I gave it several years until I left Tasmania. But this chapter on objective morality is fundamental, and it's based on what I was giving there in the university, with many adaptations, of course. And it, it deals with the question of what sometimes is called moral relativism. Is morality what you make of it? So that one person says, well, I think that's wrong. And the other one says, well, I don't. Well, then to each his own. That's the idea, that we can make up our own morality. And this chapter is saying, no, there's no morality that you make up. It's based on human nature, which we all have. And so it's a, it's a pivotal chapter. It comes at the beginning. And then going through the other chapters, just to make a few comments on them. We have foundations of moral life. So this is those questions of general issues of morality that are covered in the beginning of chapter three of the Catechism and in every treatment of moral theology. General questions of morality like human freedom. Are we free? Because if we're not free, we can't make choices and decisions that we have to answer to someone for, freedom and responsibility. But we are free the role of conscience, a very important topic and a very misunderstood topic about which there's enormous confusion even amongst many Catholics. So what is conscience and what isn't it? Virtues and vices. Virtues help us to do the right thing. We can form virtues, but vices are forming too, bad habits. Then the role of the emotions very important because we all have emotions and they can influence the morality of our acts by reducing the culpability or increasing the merit of acts. Then the question of sin 
And we don't go into the Catholic terminology here, but we saw that, show that some sins are more serious than others, and they have more serious consequences. The value of temptations, chapter, a little section on temptations. Temptations are very important, too, in our moral life. And I was just telling someone this morning that in a particular area, just take chastity. If a person has a lot of temptations and overcomes them, then they are growing in the virtue of chastity and gaining a great merit every time they overcome a temptation. If they fall, then they're committing sins. So I always say temptations are sources of sanctity and of sin. But suppose a person doesn't have any temptations against chastity, then there's no merit <laughs> in being chaste if you weren't tempted. There's no merit if you don't have any temptations. So temptations are quite valuable in the spiritual life. So that's chapter 3, Foundations of Moral Life. And that leads to chapter 4, which I put in because it's the value of suffering. Everybody suffers in varying degrees for varying lengths of time. And suffering can be a great asset if we can receive it well or it can threaten are passing the final exam if suffering leads us to reject God, there couldn't be a God, I hate God allowing me to suffer like this. Suffering has great value if we accept it well. And in that chapter, which is based on another talk I gave in the University of Tasmania when I was there, I was organizing bioethics seminars. The first one was in, on, on the topic of euthanasia, which was in the air in the mid 1990s, and then I had four in the four years that I was there before I left for Melbourne. And in one of those, I gave a talk on the Christian meaning of suffering. And in that, I identified seven blessings of suffering. Suffering can be a blessing. Yes, it involves pain, suffering in various ways, but if we accept it well, there can be blessings in it. And I listed seven, others might come up with more. But that chapter, I think, is a very valuable one in this book. If somebody wants to see some meaning in suffering, which will always remain a mystery, but this chapter could be very helpful. Then we go then to the Ten Commandments. So the first one of those is chapter five, the worship of God. And with all of the commandments, I am showing the reader, this is not Judeo-Christian ethics. This is natural law. It applies to everybody. The natural law obliges everyone. And on that basis, God will judge us. So the, the first three commandments, which relate to the worship of God, are basic natural law too, because all civilizations have religion. They have some way of worshiping God. They have prayer. They might have sacrifice. They might have a priesthood. They might have some form of worship that we would call liturgy. The next chapter is called Love for Our Neighbor. And before entering into the last seven commandments which relate to love for our neighbor, I thought I would put one in which has some general aspects of charity and love for our neighbor. And the subheadings there are love for strangers and enemies, forgiving, avoiding prejudices, and putting ourselves out for others with generosity. In the area of forgiving, I had a paragraph on the Abdallahs. And you will all be aware of that, that name and that beautiful couple who had three children killed on the 1st of February a few years ago, hit by that car driving at 150 kilometers an hour. The driver was under the influence of alcohol and drugs on a street, Beddington Road, where the speed limit is 60. And they forgave, they forgave that driver the very next day, Layla. So I put a chapter on them, uh, not a chapter, a paragraph, and I sent it to Danny just to see whether he was happy with it, and he was. So they have the Abdallahs in that chapter too. And then the rest of the commandments, honor your father and your mother, that's the most natural of commandments. You shall not kill. Here we deal with not only murder, but euthanasia. 
and suicide and scandal in terms of killing the soul of somebody and neglecting health, which is a sin against the fifth commandment too. Then you shall not commit adultery. And when I was starting to write the book, I asked myself, are you going to go into things like contraception, IVF, questions that are not the key ones in marriage and, and life? And I thought to myself, well, you really ought to, because you don't want to let any readers down by not mentioning it. And in writing it, based everything on the natural law, the use of contraception goes against the natural law, it's not just against Paul the Sixth Humani Vitae or Pius XI, Casti Canubi in 1930. It's against the natural law. And that was what both of those encyclicals referred back to, the natural law. And I have some very nice quotes on, on the use of contraception from various people, including people that maybe wouldn't have been Catholic at the time. And, and one of the ones in contraception is John Paul II in Familiaris Consortium, maybe from other addresses of his too, where he is, he is saying, if you use contraception, you don't love your spouse. It's not love. <laughs> it's a very interesting idea, but that comes back to human nature and things that people can relate to. Am I really loving my spouse if I'm using contraception while we are engaging in marital intimacy? And on abortion, you have to deal with abortion. One of the best quotes there is, is Mother Teresa of Calcutta speaking to 4,000 people at a national prayer breakfast in Washington. And present were President Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary and Vice President Al Gore and his wife. And diminutive Mother Teresa, I've never met her, but she was very short. And she gets up and undoubtedly without any notes, she never spoke with notes, she just spoke from the heart. And she is telling 4,000 Americans, including a president and his wife, who would have had quite different ideas on that topic, that abortion is the biggest threat to human, to, to, to peace on earth. And she says, if we can tell a mother that she can kill her, her baby, how can we tell people not to kill each other? <laughs> she makes such eminent common sense. So quotes like that in this book I think are going to help a lot of people who may have had preconceived ideas contrary to what I've written to rethink at least what they are doing and how they look on certain aspects of morality. <clears throat> then you shall not steal, so the seventh commandment, various aspects of that. The common ones, you shall not bear false witness about lying and about respecting the good name of others. There's lots of analogies and, and stories given to highlight how we live out these various truths. You shall not covet, and I put both the ninth and tenth commandments there. Then the final chapter in the book entitled The Final Exam is entitled The Final Exam which raises the question, what can we expect in the judgment? When we get to the judgment itself, we lived a good life, we've tried to live a good life, we all fail, we sin, we tell God we're sorry, and now we come to the judgment. What can we expect there? And I have a number of subheadings, I'll just read them. We must be sorry for our sins. The bottom line, which comes in the Catechism, in point 1033, and I quote this so often, that the only thing you need to do to avoid hell is be sorry for your serious sins. So sorry, sorrow for sin is fundamental. Now, we will be judged by how we have used the gifts God has given us. This is fundamental too. In other words, we will all be judged differently. Two people of the same age went to the same school, lived in the same suburb, had the same type of job, had different gifts, had different graces. One was a Catholic, one wasn't. One grew up in a happy, loving family. Another one grew up in a family that was troubled. Mom and dad split up. The gifts, the talents, 
the, the grace that God has given us will be a, a, an important factor in how he judges us. From the one to whom much was given, much will be demanded. And I keep telling people, and let me take advantage of it to say it here, that God has given me very much. I lived for two years in Rome with a saint, canonized Saint Jose Maria. What I am as a priest, I owe tremendously to him, plus all the formation I've been receiving since then and before then in Opus Dei. And the number of souls that are within the, the sphere of my priestly action, which is books, which is a blog with half-hour meditations that goes out on the internet and people access it from 40 countries a month, whatever it might be. And lots of souls depend on me. So God is going to ask a tremendous account of me. And so I always say, pray for me because <laughs> the call I have to give is enormous. So we will all be judged differently. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And it just reminds the reader, we can't get away with anything before God. We can get away with a lot <laughs> here on earth, but not before God. So let's be honest with him, live our lives in sincerity. Then God will take into account what we knew or did not know about his law. Because <clears throat> someone asked me the other day, suppose someone grew up in a culture where they practiced cannibalism. I don't know whether this still exists in the world. But suppose someone grew up in a culture where they practice cannibalism. Well, that's killing people and eating their flesh. This is abhorrent. It goes against the natural law. But if that's all they knew, and they did it because that's what everybody else did, God will take that into account. He will expect more from Catholics because we have received a very solid formation. We have here, but not all Catholics have received the solid formation that, that many of us here have. So God will take into account in the judgment how much we knew. So God is just, God is fair. And then finally getting closer to God. We're going to face him in the judgment. Let's not be surprised by who he is. Let's get to know him more. That comes in an earlier chapter too of growing in prayer life growing in love for God, so that when we meet him, we don't have to be afraid of the judgment. He is a merciful, yes, just God. And our judge, as Jesus says, will be himself. Jesus, the Father, has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So that's the content of the book, and I'll finish there. <laughs>